Welcome everyone to this live session at Be Infinite. My name is Negin Khorasani, the founder of Be Infinite and your host today. Be Infinite offers a platform for online transformative learning to realign people with their inner balance, life purpose, and holistic health, which results in more fulfillment in all areas of their lives. Our program today is an introduction to the power of uncertainty. Now, a little bit on how our session unfolds today. We start the session by brief centering meditation and intention. Then we learn about our guest and his background. We will also have a discussion with him about the power of uncertainty. As we go along, please feel free to send us your questions in the comment section of this session and we'll address them in the Q&A segment. So before we open our conversation, let's have a centering meditation and intention together. Now I invite everyone to anchor ourselves in the present moment and in our hearts. Find your comfortable position in the chair and close your eyes. Let your body relax. Let your breathing become deep and slow. Move your attention to your heart. Breathe from your heart. Take a deep breath in and out from the center of your chest. Let go of the outside world and rest for a moment in the warmth of your heart. Remain still and quiet and go deeper into this space of awareness you have within. From this place of awareness and potentiality, let's have the intention that our session today will bring the highest learning for all of us on how we can live with more ease, choice, and courage in our lives. With acceptance and trust to the flow of life. Now, while still remaining centered in your heart, holding this intention, Gently open your eyes. Now we are ready to start our conversation. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Doug Vogel, NLP and hypnosis practitioner. Hi, Doug. Hello, Nagin. Thank you for joining us today. It's my absolute pleasure. Wonderful. It's a pleasure to have you. So let's begin by um, sharing, if, you po if possible, sharing a little bit about yourself and your journey with us. Absolutely. Well, I would have to go back to a very early age. As I recall, I was approximately four years old and I was sitting outside my house in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I was sitting under a... Uh, I think it's what's considered a birdberry bush, although it was poisonous to humans, I was told. And I was sitting there and I felt this void. I felt this emptiness inside me. And I knew that it wasn't me. And I knew there was more. I knew there was more to experience. In other words, I knew something wasn't, wasn't quite right uh, in my environment and more importantly, how I felt about my environment. And I was aware of 
subjectively feeling pain and feeling confusion and I could look at it. And as I sat there, I still remember making a promise to myself that in my future, when anybody that anybody who I knew or even otherwise was experiencing pain or difficulty or having problems that I would help them. And that was a very early uh, decree, if you will, uh, that worked its way throughout my life, I believe. Then uh, as life goes on, I was approximately uh, 18 and I decided once again that in my relationships, there was confusion, there was upset, uh, there were issues. I could feel these ideas of projection and blame and <laughs> disruption of my, uh, of my true self. And so I just walked into the community hospital and I said, I wanna to talk to somebody. I said, I know there's something going on, some issues I'm having and I need to talk with somebody. It was so amazing. There was this young therapist there who charged me very little and he dedicated himself to listening to me uh, for six months. And that was kind of my introduction to be able to take apart these identities that people wear, these mixed emotions that people have, and to clarify uh, one's intention and what one uh, what one's purpose is. Um, that was that was a quite lovely experience, and it made a difference. Uh, along with this, I do need to mention that a few years earlier, I would sit alone in my room and. I wasn't a loner. I was very friendly with a lot of people. Uh, I'm an Aquarian and Aquarians like to make friends and they like to be very creative. Uh, but I also had the other side of me, which uh, was uh, beckoning me forward. And I recall this, and I think this is important uh, to understand how this works is that I would sit on my bed and I would look at the wall across the room. And as I did, uh, it dawned on me weeks or so later that the sensation of re-emerging from the wall took place. So this meditation, this trance state that I automatically developed, which was a feeling of liberation, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of completion, a feeling of ultimate creativity, I was very, very pleased to find out that I was able to create this and experience it. And the sensation of, as I said, being what I call inside the wall disappearing. So I was able to disappear for a half hour, 45 minutes. And then I was able to train myself. And I thought I, I discovered just the most beautiful thing on earth. I could not believe that something, you know, it's like being a wizard or a magician where you can create your own dream world. And it truly was that. And so then I intentionally set about doing it. So I would follow the steps out of this trance state. And again, I was 14 or 15. I would follow my the steps out of the trance state and I would see if I would duplicate it so I could actually intentionally create it. And I was able to follow myself back into this, back into this wall, completely dis disappear and yet be conscious of this state. And so that kind of, uh, I think, was another signal for my, for my future. Uh, I'll skip ahead just a little bit. My parents died in the late 80s and 90s. And uh, I'll kind of get to this point now where I really sensed a huge change. I really sensed that I had to, uh, I had a purpose in my life and I wasn't really uh, following it. I was involved uh, in studying behaviorism and cognitive therapy with a uh, borderline and severe autistic adult population. And so I did have some behavioral tools. Um, at the same time, I was studying uh, hypnosis at the National Guild. 
Uh, then I would go on to complete the Ericksonian uh, Master Practitioner Program. Uh, but being with my mother and father during the transition, I think really installed this peak experience and what it's like to have everything on the line, to have life and death, uh, to review your past, to experience such deep loss, to experience their loss. And uh, it was uh, to see them healing is the way I look at it. They were healing, even though they <clears throat> died three years apart. To be amidst that was transformative. So I wasn't afraid of it. And I wasn't uh, going to deny myself this privilege of assisting them during this time. Uh, and so that was kind of the beginning of me being a private practitioner, studying neurolinguistics, uh, studying Ericksonian hypnosis, NLP, and all the rest of it. Um, and I will say this, finally, that what I really wanted to do, and because I had since explored traditional therapy, and I found that it was too slow, it wasn't working, people were following a particular script or paradigm, but it really wasn't touching upon the experience of the client or the patient. And having experienced that, I really wanted to discover the absolute best tools, uh, whatever they were. In this case, they were psychotherapeutic tools from neurolinguistics. I really wanted to discover the best tools and I, I found them. And I was able to then start a pretty long uh, career, uh, especially the first 15 years uh, very steady clientele and uh, very great satisfaction in being able to live this dream uh, to be able to help people. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your journey. So inspiring. Um, really interesting to listen to your story. And uh, I, I know that you do uh, quite a number of uh, modalities. You mentioned some of them in your uh, uh, when you talked about your background, uh, so uh, reality therapy, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, EMDR, EFT, NLP. Could you please explain about these healing modalities and uh, basically what it does, how it helps, how each one of them can help? Yes, and let me start off by I think one of the most important modalities that can easily be in the category of hypnosis, which is meditation. So meditation, when applied in a singular purpose on one's own, can really begin to let the unconscious have room to breathe. Meditation can allow for resolution of issues at a much deeper level. Um, so that kind of brought me, as well as these modalities we're discussing, meditation for me now and many times over the years is the foundation of a lot of this work. Uh, reality therapy, I was trained and certified in, in the late 80s. And really, this was for the tougher end of the population. This is for... Uh, adults who were having issues, borderline adults, autistic, who were having issues being able to make good choices in their life. So this was developed in the late 80s by Dr. William Glasser. And really what it does is it focuses on five choices in our lives. The choice for freedom, fun, survival, power, love, and belonging. And quite simply, what it does is it just aligns I align myself with the goals of the client or the person and decide what small steps will be taken. These steps have to be realistic, reasonable, and masterable. And by these meetings with the person, we come up with small steps that will begin to in, uh, create changes in behavior. Um, and uh, its focus is the here and now. With this particular modality, 
uh, there is really little or no uh, endeavor for me to go back into the past to discuss the emotional issues or psychological problems. This is basically, what do you want? Here are the choices. Let's develop an outline. And then we collaborate. And then when we meet again, I discuss what choices they made, what the results were. Then we modify the next week, if that's the time frame we have, we modify the choices and we move closer again towards small step successes. And again, it holds true that people will often follow these steps if they're small enough, if they're chunk small enough, if they're doable, and especially if it's going to help increase fun or power or love or belonging. So they get immediate results with the use of reality therapy. So that's kind of mixed in with what I do, uh, but I think it's a great foundation. So that's reality therapy. And how about Ericksonian hypnotherapy? Yep, yep. I'll continue with Ericksonian. So with Ericksonian hypnosis, um, really what we're looking at is uh, metaphor, indirect suggestion, uh, storytelling, and all of these to modify behavior. Uh, I can only speak very highly of Milton Erickson. I would recommend anybody who is interested in finding uh, material is, is prevalent. It's, it's out there uh, on YouTube and you can also Google it. Uh, he was a man known to get uh, some of the best and longest lasting results from a client. Uh, as a child, he had polio twice. He was dys dyslexic. He was colorblind and he was tone deaf. And he went on to become a doctor and the father of hypnotherapy. And so for him, rather than diagnosing or coming up with labeling, he would actually take in or absorb the person's story, their language, their frames of reference, their posture, their breathing. He would, he would, as opposed to reality therapy, he would ask them questions about their past, about their, uh, how they create these different states of consciousness whether it's specific problems they're having, um, certainly that, as well as what's important, he would elicit in them resources. So really what he was about was uh, reframing and uh, looking at a person, not as the sum of their issues or the sum of their parts, but as the totality and as a person who is extremely resourceful. And he knew what that was because he became extremely resourceful from that very difficult, uh, medically challenged, uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally challenged. So he used his skill set, even though his senses and other parts of his being were challenged, he so focused, so keenly focused on those in order to build up his senses and to become resourceful. Uh, so he really knew how to create a resourceful state uh, from a state that may be considered uh, uh, lacking or, uh, or bothersome, to say the least. Uh, what's different about Ericksonian hypnosis, which I like and, what, and why I've gotten a lot of success, and I have gotten a lot of success, I can tell because I see the responses from from clients I've had is that it's a naturalistic state which we develop. So in his understanding, hypnosis is an everyday occurrence. It's a natural state that we go in and out of all the time. Uh, one can think about taking a drive in a car, how one loses oneself, looking across uh, a landscape at a mountain or some scenic view, and all of a sudden time just disappears, you know, similar to a meditation. So this is the area I'm interested in, what happens when things disappear? And that was an early lesson that I got, where are you? What are you experiencing? How can we utilize when things disappear? And, and I realized that 
uh, personally, again, it's not it's not scary to disappear. That it's actually a very wholesome, whole, uh, unifying experience. So from his place of everything is a trance, as I said, even daydreaming uh, is another form of trance. What Ericksonian hypnosis does, it is it does encourage a person's resources. It helps to, in this open format of discussion, of relaying what happened as they were driving to the session as a way of me telling a story, of course, keeping privacy issues uh, at foremost, but relaying a neutral story about a client. So as all this is going on, a person is sorting through their various memories, experiences, they're identifying and associating in many ways with what I'm talking about. And you know, part of it is, and this is I'm you know, generalizing, it's more than this, but part of it is then you know, metaphorically touching upon what the client brings to me. And in a, an associative way, bringing up ways that people got through stumbling blocks, that people found the answers they were looking for, that people uh, found the behavior that was necessary in order to make that change. Um, and um, the other point I want to make, which is interesting, uh, so this is this is a key point to the work that I do, and it's a lovely point. I'm so glad that you asked me to speak today, Nagin, because I came across the uh, the neuro linguistic meta model. So I'm not going to jump ahead, but neuro linguistics is really uh, a uh, a, an, an add-on or it's, it, it's uh, adjacent, if you will, to Ericksonian uh, hypnosis. Oh, and, what I, and Doc, sorry to interrupt. And, and, and neurolinguistic is what is called uh, NLP in, in the conversational, thank right? You. Yes, that's correct. NLP. So this is a, a real clear kind of overview of how this work actually works. So this is called a meta model and it's clearly described i think you'll quite easily be able to understand it the world influences us through external stimulus through our senses that's how we create reality sights sounds feelings words they all come into ourselves then we internalize them through our perceptions so this these are filters so the outside world comes in through the senses then it comes in through these filters, which are beliefs, values, and language. In that language, there are general, generalizations, distortions, and deletions. So what I'm, what I'm implying is that as we perceive the world, we then filter it through beliefs, values, and language. It then enters this last place, which I'll designate. I'm calling this a state, and I'm gonna be working with state in the three session work uh, that I'm gonna be doing with the power of uncertainty. So from the external stimulus through beliefs and values, then finally, how we represent the world in our states. So, and this is, neurolinguistic programming, NLP, that I'm talking about. So our state is based on the very fine tuning of our senses and physiology. Then what pops out the other side is behavior. So my, my key point to this is that any of the things I just discussed, if one changes one element of any of these, it's going to change some part of the rest of them because the whole is greater than the part the parts so when we change this how the brain sorts and files in a session or and it gets back to my point of i wanted the best tools for myself so part of what i do is i teach people how to master this um to be the director if you will, of this. If you saw it as a movie and you're setting up the stage and you've got actors on it 
and you've got people who are have a narrative and a story, and then you have uh, characters who have very strong beliefs or weak beliefs, and then obviously a state which is based on physiology and internal representations. What's great news about all of that is that if you change any one of those, the rest can also change rather rather quickly, um, and so that's the uh, meta model. Uh, from NLP, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but NLP was developed in the 80s in California by John Grinder and Richard Bandler. It was their college thesis. And again, what they wanted to do, they wanted to go through all of the best thinkers, the best doers, and find out, and the best therapists, find out what therapist had the most success and lasting success in the, in a brief amount of time, goes to my point that a lot of Western medicine just lingers people forward. I'm not saying that it's not a good road. Everybody has to go down their own road. Uh, and I wanted to find out what really was going to work. Uh, and I will say that who they studied was, this is a key point, they studied Milton Erickson. This is the founders of NLP. They studied Milton Erickson who was the father of hypnotherapy. They studied Virginia Satir, who was a well-renowned family therapist who had great success over the years. She was more in the, I believe, the 40s and 50s and 60s. And they studied Fritz Perls, who was the renowned Gestalt therapist. Uh, and they put together all of the learnings. They put it together in kind of a scientific, scientific approach, and they wanted to put it in the hands of other people. So in terms of psychotherapeutic tools, I think they're the, the best, some of the best out there that I've, that I've discovered. Wonderful. So I believe there is one more tool you wanted to discuss, right? If uh, yes. So uh, in the program I'll be offering, um, there's a, a couple that I think are important, and these are kind of the mainstay of my personal uh, spiritual practice, if you will. Um, and one is called EFT, which is Emotional Freedom Technique. So Gary Craig is the founder of this. Um, I'm sure there are others who one could also look up. I would recommend looking up Gary Craig. Uh, very inspirational man. There are videos on YouTube. Uh, I was really taken by this method, which really involves uh, creating a state, which is based on physiology, breathing, and internal representations. It's a matter of then addressing it through the uh, energy meridians, which happen to be located in this scenario, in the face and in the back of the hand, and also in the chest region. Um, and so what this entails quite simply is just making a statement of complete acceptance uh, of oneself. And then now as I'm kind of looking back and how I use this uh, and whether it's with clients or myself, what is going on? What is the presenting issue? What's the problem? Where is there an energy blockage? And I discovered that doing, and I'm going to apply this in the, the three session work of, of the power of uncertainty. What I discovered is that number one, by writing a uh, unedited uh, first draft of whatever is going on, free association, this brings in the unconscious, which I believe in, I believe in it's powerful state, its resourceful state, its ability to, uh, to uh, bring forward the um, information that one is looking for. Um, and so by doing this unedited writing and just letting it all out, number one, number two, decide on what state you're working with. In this case, it could be a state that is uh, not positive, not productive. Maybe one is not congruent. Somebody has to make an important decision or they're involved in a certain relationship. 
things are coming up. So this is a way to clear it out by number one, doing this simple writing of uned unedited writing. Number two, in that writing, there's a few questions, it's very specific questions to get to the core of the issue. This is what I use currently. This is what I'm gonna be using in the near future as well. And then three, deciding on what state one needs to work with. And then quite simply, and it works uh, with anything, with a positive state or with a uh, unresourceful state. And then simply by starting with here, these are the meridian points. And by the way, this has been researched by the American Psychological Association that finds that, um, that it is comparable with the results of other therapies. So it actually is getting uh, by its, uh, the uh, ability for them to see uh, the changes that are occurring in their studies, they've decreed it to be a valuable uh, modality. And so I fully and completely accept myself and this works even now, I fully and completely accept myself. I fully and completely accept myself. Even as I'm talking to Nagin, discussing things that are important, gee, I hope I discuss the things that are going to be helpful for people. I fully and deeply accept myself. Let me not mess up. Let me be the best I can. <laughs> have, have I messed up in the past? And even if one reviews times that they've messed up, and I did this before the session, so I went through times where I wasn't eloquent. I went through experiences that where I fumbled. And, and this clear, my experience is that this clears the way energetically to change one's state. <sighs> and it can work rather quickly. Uh, I can say from my own experience and those with clients, it works immediately. Uh, and you can repeat the process. So this is something that you can certainly learn, one can learn on their own. I can teach it. Uh, you can utilize it regularly as states, conditions, feelings, blocks come up, you can use it then. Um, so, Emotional freedom technique, I think it says it all. You can use it with pain, uh, physical pain as well. You can use it with trauma, fear, and certainly uncertainty about what one's direction is. And then lastly, the other technique which I'm currently using, which I like a great deal, and which is getting good results for me, I've used it the past couple of years, is EMDR. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprogramming. And so uh, Francine, I think her name was Shapiro, uh, she discovered, uh, it had to be now back in the 1990s, uh, she discovered by walking in a, in a park one day that, and she was uh, going through some some state of being, some thoughts, some feelings, perhaps a distraction from her goal of the day or her intention of the day. And uh, she discovered, she's a, a psychologist, she, disco she discovered quite randomly that as she moved her eyes back and forth during the experience she was having, that it altered her state of consciousness. And part of this research as I recall, is based on uh, rapid eye movement. So this rapid eye movement, which we utilize, which happens automatically during sleep, during our REM uh, time at night, where we locate uh, scenes, locate images from scenes, we locate storylines, we locate resources, we locate people and events, and like this, we cross-reference all of them. So it's random, it's, it appears to be spontaneous, it accesses other states of being, and it can integrate uh, these states so that we're left in a more resourceful uh, condition. So uh, big hats off to the uh, woman there who discovered it. Uh, I find it to be really valuable. It's easy to learn. You know, part of my goal, as I said early on, is that I want to be of help to people. This was a very early intention. Uh, 
and I'm hoping that today's talk is helpful to people. I'm here only to be of help. And so my, uh, my intention is to put these tools in the hands of other people. That's what I wanna do, to find out what is stopping us from living in the here and now, which these tools I'm discussing do, and how to give us some control, some choice about our states of being. So right now, my physiology, my breathing, with Nagin here on the telephone, knowing that this is going out to other people, being so excited about these, these topics, I am creating this resourceful state, this helpful state, uh, helpful for me and hopefully for others. So this is all about choice and, uh, and putting ourselves into these states, these resourceful states. And lastly, EFT and EMDR, along with you know, NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis, what they all do is they help to clear us and allow us to be more in the present moment. Um, they address issues that are blocking us energetically, psychologically, emotionally, and they give, they put us that, uh, the ability for us to author our lives once again. It doesn't shy away from facing difficulty. It doesn't shy away from facing fear. It doesn't shy away from, from facing what we are perceiving that we set up as our weaknesses. It really embraces all of us and discovers that beneath our fear, beneath our uncertainty, beneath our sadness, beneath our confusion is a, is a state of, of oneness, a state of very deep understanding and a state of, of complete, uh, a complete peace. We're, uh, I think I will end up by saying this, that we had an initial break in our early childhood. There was a separation. Uh, we reached this, um, this state of, of conflict um, and we, we split off from our original self. This is my understanding. And we then set this in motion through it, this information is repressed. What exactly happened, we'll never fully know. We can point to it, we can visit there, we can actually go back and we can look at it and bring resources back there. Uh, but this void, that is filled by desire, that is filled with a sense of lack, that there's never really enough. All of that is this emptiness. And where this emptiness shows itself is in our current day relationships, in our current day environment, in our current day gripes and complaints. This, any issue we're having is sent forth from this split, from this trauma, from this soft spot, it's sent forward into our present and it starts to work its way through relationships, experiences, jobs, events. So my point here is that this emptiness that we experienced as a child, this separation, this split is also important because it is the same emptiness, the same area where the split is, is it, where this emptiness is, where this void is, that once we get through these states, these negative, if you will, states, that that emptiness, that void, that aloneness is actually filled, filled with resources, filled with, with humor, it's filled with joy, it's filled with reconciliation where these parts that are conflicted, they find a way to talk to each other. They find a way to commune. They find a way to bring their best forward. And it's by looking at it and being with it and being in that, that emptiness. It's about including it. It's about allowing it. And it's about expanding it. Uh, and uh, that if there was a message, that would be it. Allow this, these expressions include them and uh, expand them because these, the, these are messages from our past that we're sending to ourselves to be healed. And 
it's yes, it's an there's not a you know one off and done thing. Yes, it's a regular process, uh, and these tools can assist you in in living uh, living your best life. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Doc, for all this very very um, helpful information you shared and very inspiring. Uh, can you also share a little bit about your program, The Power of Uncertainty? What is it all about? Oh, you are on mute, Doc. Sorry. Ah, here I am. Uh, yes, so I made a few notes about this. Uh, so I encourage people to be honest uh, especially with me when it comes to therapy and I'm being honest with myself. So several years ago, I ran into a dark area with myself and uh, this conventional uh, Western approach, traditional therapy, I uh, pretended that I was 18 again and I could just walk into a hospital in 1973 and have this wonderful doctor take me under his wing and care for this young child, care for this essential being, and that everything was gonna be okay. And I came to find out that, you know, I was involved in a, a system that pretty much is a closed system. Uh, and I wanted to find uh, a way through this and that's why I developed this program. That's why this program is important to me, this power of uncertainty. Um, because I was feeling very uncertain and it was painful. Uh, it, it was challenging. Uh, I questioned my life and how I was gonna move forward. Um, then of course I began to come upon my tools again. And it's funny because it, you know, just rediscovering my tools for myself. I was so used to being other uh, focused that I had to focus these energies on myself. And it took a little bit of time for me to get through it. Uh, but it gave me such a, a purpose. It gave me such a value for embracing uh, uncertainty uh, and what we can achieve even while we're in that, that state, that that and our true selves can work uh, together. So what I was considering in uh, this program is number one, you know, introduce what it is we're gonna be utilizing. And this program could have, be, could have been called understanding states of consciousness because really uncertainty is just one of the states. I think you can tell by my earlier conversation that you know, I'm interested in how to build better states, more resourceful states. I, a person brings a state of being to me and uh, by them inhabiting it, we can discover what's working and what's not. So the power of uncertainty, you will learn how to move through these states. One of them and the key for me in writing this and, and coming up with this program was this uncertainty that drove me to rediscover my skill set again. Um, and so the first session, the hour and a half session, will be about focusing on how we create states and what our intention is for each one of these states. Um, it'll be about learning how this everyday natural state of trance uh, and how this naturalistic language that I use can easily um, bring a person uh, towards a feeling of comfort and safety and relaxation. While they begin the process, the first class will be learning how to witness uh, the issue. And that's a key factor. Again, I talked about meditation earlier, which is similar to trance, except trance is more of a focused, a language-driven experience. So by experiencing states, understanding very simple steps of hypnosis, and even I'll 
teach self-hypnosis and allowing, accepting, and expanding whatever state they're in uh, and finding out what intention it has because often these states are asking us to take, take a look inside. And so, and during the first, at the end of the first session, I'll introduce emotional freedom technique and EMDR, and then a person will, will leave the session uh, and certainly my email and uh, my phone number, I welcome people to contact me. And I will also ask people to keep a journal to then practice this new modality that week. Uh, the second week, what's important is, and this will take a little bit of time, I, I wanna really hear how people responded to it. I wanna find out what works, what didn't work um, for those who, want privacy for their own experiences, that's fine too. Uh, but for those who want to share, it's a good time to do that. Uh, so in the second uh, session, we'll continue to witness these various states uh, and see that as these states come up, that we're not any of these states. We're that emptiness. We're that void. We're pure creativity, we're pure love, we're pure peace. So what happens is by utilizing these techniques, pure peace, pure love, pure belonging kind of erupt out of them. And it's an ongoing uh, process uh, and uh, that, I can, that I can assure you of. Uh, and so we'll discuss on the second uh, session what identities are and these identities are really fixed learnings from our past. These identities, you know, or masks or, you know, parts of ourselves that are disowned or that aren't our, you know, our false self. I mean, these are just descriptions, however accurate or inaccurate they are. It's just a way of understanding. And so we'll then uh, talk about identities and I'm sure we'll experience some of those identities such as the critic, the judge, uh, perfectionist, the hero, uh, the comic. Uh, so all of these parts of us, these are, these are identities uh, that are based on uh, our past experiences. And we shall then go through that. And finally, the last session, uh, which I'm sure by now after people have been practicing this, having experiences, are getting results, and I, I trust people will get results. Uh, we'll finally uh, talk a little bit more to those parts after practicing some, some of those uh, techniques at home, and we will practice the method that I've discussed. Uh, we'll be utilizing that tool of when anybody's in a difficult state, using the uh, the Lousy first rough draft. Number two, a set of questions, which are only five very brief questions that a person will answer. Number three, go into that state they're in and then utilize the emotional freedom technique. And then four, uh, and sometimes that's enough. Uh, but for me, I want to make sure that I've cleared away as much as I can. Then I finish it off with EMDR which I'll discuss in detail uh, during the second uh, course. And so lastly, we'll incorporate those parts and um, I will wish everybody well. And as I said, I am available to talk, any questions, any thoughts, uh, any uh, issues that arise, I am here and available to, uh, to help those who, who need that kind of help. Beautiful. Thank you. So the good news is that uh, Doug is actually offering the power of uncertainty on the Be Infinite platform. So I want to quickly share my screen uh, to show um, where you can find it on our page. So when you go to our website, uh, in our program, we have a category named health and vitality. And uh, power of uncertainty is right there. You can click on it. It takes you to the right place and you can read through the information if you wish to, you know, more carefully uh, think about it. 
And this is all the information about the length of the session, the dates of the sessions. There are three sessions on three consecutive weeks. And uh, with all the invaluable tools that Doug just explained, you will learn and the lasting tools that you will have for the rest of your life, basically. The price is set so, you know, um, economically and reasonably only to make it accessible for everyone. So I wish you can uh, join us in this class starting from the 22nd of this month. Um, it's a Monday and every Monday, three Mondays in a row, basically we continue with this class. So um, at this point, I want to uh, also share the contact information of DOG for those of you who are inspired and would like to uh, have uh, the possibility of connection and asking your questions. Just bear with me a second. Okay, here we go. You can take a snapshot and have it for yourself so you can get in touch easily. Okay. So at this point, we are ready to answer some questions. We have like nine minutes more left for us. So we cannot address many questions, but at least some questions. So I have one question for you, Doug, before actually we um, receive other questions. Why is this specific program important to you, this power of uncertainty? <laughs> Because it has left the most lasting recent impression on me, uh, where impressionable people are uh, selection of the past is, is selective. And so when I was thinking about offering a program, I had to recognize what was currently the most valuable way for a person to develop resources in the midst of challenges, in the midst of uh, feeling trepidation, in the midst of this uncertainty. And uh, I was so pleased to come out of that, those various states that I felt like it was my mission, kind of similar to that that child I was talking about who was on a mission at a very early age to help people, I, you know, I got a very direct statement. So with this, when you and I were discussing how to move uh, forward with me offering various uh, programs or help, this came right to mind and it was basically telling me, this is, this is what you'll do, this is most valuable. Thank you, thank you, that's very enlightening. So we have received one question says, uh, do you think that there is a room for psychedelics in hypnotherapy, like uh, psychedelic assisted hypnotherapy? I, I do, I do. Um, I think the, the reason I say that is because what we're looking for is really an altered state. And in altered states, and some of them are very positive, helpful learning experiences in those, these altered states, that's really the most direct route into change. Um, the human mind can only think of five plus two or minus two things at any given time. So the conscious, I meant to say conscious mind, can only think of five or be aware of five plus two or minus two things. So where is everything else? You know, where is your, your, that success you had in your, uh, in your twenties? Where is that brilliant feeling you had when you completed that course? Where is that deep, deep learning you did when you decided to start your new career and branch off into these directions and, and be so resourceful? So the answer is, I do think 
that even, uh, and uh, I haven't explored it and I am considering exploring that uh, and maybe starting at some point in the future with a cannabis assisted a therapy in order to achieve altered states. So really it's about perception. It's about looking at things differently. When you look about, when you look at things differently, you feel differently. When you look at things differently, you feel differently. And one of the things that successful therapy does is it changes your view of yourself and it changes your view of the world. So yes, that's something I am interested in. Thank you for that clarification. I, I guess in certain situations, it's helpful, right? Um, if a person is in a more balanced state, less painful, there always is more time to access the state with other ways. But in some cases, that's a kind of shortcut. And absolutely, yes. And that's why I, I don't say unequivocally that I recommend it uh, across the board. Uh, it, and uh, I have had a couple therapists call me and to get some consultation because they were using uh, uh, hallucinogenics, if you will, in a therapeutic setting. Uh, and I was this was a year or so ago, and I was very cautious, as I am cautious now. Uh, but it's becoming more acceptable, and there's there's a lot of research that uh, utilizing psychedelics can really be a shortcut to and a lasting can provide lasting changes for post traumatic stress mm -hmm. and, and deep trauma. I would I would end by saying this: it really is dependent on the person and the the the, the balancing function they have currently in their mind. So I would I would definitely be uh, uh, I'm optimistic, but I'm also very cautious about it. Mm. Thank you very much, Doc. There is this question. Uh, what benefits, I guess it's referring to your uh, course that you're offering, what benefits can one expect to obtain uh, attending these course? And when will those benefits show up? That's a good question, the, I think. The benefits will show up quickly. The, I've, my experiences using the EFT, EMDR, um, focusing on those right now. And of course, NLP, which is the best set of psychotherapeutic tools. In my experience, the results show up immediately. Uh, what can one expect? One can expect to allow their natural energy to come forward. These are tools that work immediately, of course, in relative degree that means something different to everybody they work quickly to free up energy to free up states to free up our point of view to free up our per our perception of ourselves and the world so it is my uh fervent desire to uh be a part of this in the way of being part of this conversation to say that uh more uh, consolidation of one's uh, uh, spiritual self, a, a point of view which leads one to being more optimistic. Uh, one can sense that uncertainty by working with this kind of program, that uncertainty is and impermanence is just a fact of life. And by being with it, witnessing it, allowing it and, and expanding upon it, that we can realize that really this was sent to us from a long time ago for us to resolve, for us to uh, create some compatibility around. Uh, this is essential for the unfoldment of ourselves. So yes, I would say more energy, uh, more optimism, uh, ability to cope with life's challenges and, uh, and a sense of, of rejuvenation. Very well said. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Doc, for joining us today. Wonderful session we had. Thank you, everyone. We are grateful for your participation and interest. Please go to our website for more information uh, on and for enrolling in the Power of Uncertainty, for receiving the latest updates about our programs, 
please make sure to subscribe to our newsletter and to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Goodbye, everyone.